So in this question, you basically have a car that's going to roll down the hill and speed up and then climb back up the hill and slow down. And hopefully he'll make it on the other side. You could probably see that it would be very difficult to work this out using F equals MA and then kinematics because, well, we're actually not even told how the profile of the slope goes. If you have a problem like this where it relates two different points in time and we don't really care about things in between, that's a good tip off that we're dealing with some kind of conservation laws. And in this case, we'll be using conservation of energy. And this problem kind of serves as an example how to lay out and use the method to do very typical conservation of energy kind of problems. But before we can actually make use of conservation of energy, we do have to establish that it is actually easy to use. What makes energy easy to use? If you look at the entire energy balance, calling this the first point, and then the next point we're interested in is that point, it is only easy to use as long as this term in the middle, this non-conservative work, is zero. So throughout the process from one to two, right, there's an invisible one to two here, we gotta check that no non-conservative work is done. So we are told a few things. Uh, the car is in neutral. It's their way of saying that there's no added energy from the engine. And then it also rolls freely. So that's their way of saying the friction between the ground and the tire goes towards rolling the wheel. We'll talk about rolling in a few weeks. And the freely implies that there are also that there's no significant friction between parts of the car, like the axle and the bearing, etc. And also hiddenly, they're assuming that there's no significant air resistance. Mm. You know, in physics, we often use one simple word like row freely to basically idealize the situation and imply that there's no frictional loss. So given all that, let's consider the forces on the car at any given point as it travels between point one to point two. Let's say it's over here, right? It's a pretty typical case. It'd be kind of the same everywhere. The direction might change, but the kind of forces remains the same. You of course mg because you're on earth. And then because you're touching the mountainside or the ground here, you have an Fn. And very critically they all that stuff they just mentioned says that there's no friction force. So then we have to verify that each of these forces does no non-conservative work. Well, clearly, uh, gravity is a con that's what we call a conservative force. The work done by this force is tracked through the changes in the potential energy. So we don't lump it in the non-conservative work term. The normal force at every single point along the motion, wherever it is, right? It's always normal to the surface and therefore normal to the displacement of the car all the time. And when you have a force that is perpendicular to the displacement, you know, looking at the dot product, you end up doing no work. So then these two things combine to give you no non-conservative work at every single point along one to two. So we don't really care about, therefore, all the points in between. Most prominently, we definitely don't care about this point at the bottom. We don't have to go through the bottom before going to the top, right? Throughout the entire motion, we can use energy conservation to directly relate all the way from one to two. If we look at the energy balance again, this middle term here is the only term that doesn't just refer to the end point. And since we established that throughout the entire travel, there's no non-conservative work, then we only care about the endpoints and none of the other points in between. I know I've been quite long-winded about this kind of concept, but it is very important to check. We can't just assume that Ke plus Pe equals Ke plus Pe. There's always the possibility of other forces doing non-conservative work. Conservation is still true, but you can't just drop a term from your energy balance. 
now that we have established that that is the case, the problem becomes a lot easier, right? And that is why we use um, conservation of energy for these kind of problems. Expanding a little bit, you got various terms. At this point, I can make myself a little table to track the various variables involved, right? There's time one and time two. There's two times you're relating. And at each time, because we're dealing with kinetic energy, we deal with speed. And because we have potential energy, we're dealing with height. So I like to list out everything in the table so it's nice and clear. At time one, my speed is 10 meters per second. At time two, I do not know my speed, but that is perfectly fine because that is the thing I'm trying to solve. Initial height at time one is at 10 meters. When we get to the gas station at time two or point two, we are at 15 meters in height. So not that we have everything, we basically just rearrange and solve. And we're solving for V2 here. Sum out algebra later, pretty simple algebra. And you notice that every single term on top has mass in it, so all those masses cancel out with the mass on the bottom. So in fact, we didn't even need to know the mass of the car. So just subbing in numbers, being careful, you know, H1 versus H2, right? All those subscripts, very important. Through the calculator, the car definitely arrives. That's a good thing. And it arrives with a speed of 1.4 meters per second left. It makes sense because it's slower than the 10 meters per second we started with because you climbed up a little bit. And that we didn't end up with some funky imaginary numbers, which tells us he would never reach up to that height. So very typical conservation of energy problem, identifying the two points you're trying to relate, double checking that there's no non-conservative work being done in between, and making that little table to track and organize all your information 